Hey, Beth. Welcome back to the show. What's up? Hey there. Thank you so much for having me again. A couple of things. First, I want to say just congratulations on how well the show's going. I'm, I'm really proud of you. Oh, thanks very much. That's kind of you. And second of all, a couple of episodes ago, you had Midori Gray on who spoke about Wings Over America Scholarship Foundation. That's right. Well, I'm also a volunteer with them. And I would just like to remind your listeners that our San Diego annual fundraiser is coming up. Okay, when is it? February 15th and 16th. So if you happen to live here in the San Diego area, we really welcome you to attend our amazing auction and fun concert that we will be hosting at the Island Club on North Island. Naval Air Station, North Island. Okay, what if people don't live in the area? So if you don't, that's okay. You can still help support this foundation. You can go online and bid on the auction items, or you can make a donation. Huh. All right. Well, where would people find you online? It's really easy. They just go to www.wingsoveramerica.us. .us, as in United States, not .com? Correct. Okay. Then you just click on the upcoming events, and you'll see it all there. And these help to support scholarships for dependents and military children. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Sounds like a worthy cause. All right. Well, thanks for swinging by. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. This week on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, it's not a fighter. It's not very sexy. But as you will learn from our guest, retired U.S. Navy Commander David Deke Slayton, it's a pretty darn good airplane for the mission it was designed to do, and even a few it wasn't. Back in the mid-60s, early 70s, the Soviets decided they wanted to have a very expeditionary blue water Navy. And to counter that, the S-3 was brought into the fleet right as the increase of the enormous and very capable Soviet surface fleet and a very capable subsurface submarine fleet was brought to bear. Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello and welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I hope everything is going well for you out there in listener land. This is episode 38. My name is Vincent Aiello, and you're stuck with just me for this part of the show. My co-host Sunshine ran off to Alaska again, but he rejoins us in a few minutes to discuss the first airplane he flew in the fleet before transitioning to the F-A-18 Hornet, and that is the Lockheed Martin S-3 Viking. Now, speaking of the F-A-18, in re-listening to parts of our interview from the last episode, I noticed I incorrectly referred to the aircraft's horizontal stabilizer. Now, most aircraft have a fixed horizontal flight surface known as the stabilizer and then a movable part on the aft end known as the elevator. But on the F-A-18, the entire flight surface moves, so that whole flight control surface is known more accurately as a horizontal stabilator. And we refer to that as just the stab or both of them as the stabs for short. Now, in other news here in our announcement section of the show, you DCS fans may have seen on our Facebook page that our parent company, BVR Productions, has teamed up with Jeff Bollinger, and his call sign is Jabbers. Jabbers has quite a YouTube following with about 13,000 subscribers and joins the team to help further develop our DCS involvement and various initiatives. If you have a question for Jabbers, you can reach him via email at jeff at bvrpro.com or via his YouTube channel. And again, you can reach anyone on our team by their first name at bvrpro.com. For Patreon updates this week, we have new division leads Mark Palmer, Jeffrey Weiser, Anthony Gifford, and Joshua Freelu. And we have four new strike leads, only three cared to be mentioned. One is Alexa Rogers, another Jim Rumble, and Matthew Bernard. I want to thank all of our Patreon supporters, and if you'd like to join them, go to www.patreon.com, search for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, and there you can gain access to exclusive content and help keep this show going. 
For our listener question segment this week, I want to start with some feedback from last week regarding the Mother Trophy. And the writer asked not to be identified, but writes, the Mother wasn't limited to the East Coast. West Coast fighter squadrons were frequent recipients of the trophy, as my former squadron and a few others received it in the 1990s. Care was required in maintaining custody of the trophy. If there was a lapse in, quote, security, Tanuki could wander off to another squadron, perhaps more deserving another squadron, i.e. be stolen, and the more creative the theft, the better. To make it even more difficult to hang on to Mother, it couldn't be locked away somewhere or otherwise kept in seclusion, but out at the O-Club, out on port calls during deployment, and in all other sorts of often weird locations. So that is just one more example of some of the fun you can have in this career. And yeah, I never knew that. I was never involved in any Mother shenanigans, but that sounds like a lot of fun. Thanks for the feedback. All right, listener questions for this week. Louie asks, what's the purpose of Air Force and Navy exchange programs? Why would the Navy train an Air Force pilot to land on a carrier and a Navy pilot to fly a land-based carrier? Louie, it all comes down to interoperability. These days, the Air Force, the Navy, and even the Marine Corps, and other countries for that matter, all need to interoperate with other branches of service and other countries. And so in sending pilots to have a tour with an exchange unit, such as an Air Force guy with a Navy, then when the Air Force guy goes back to his unit, if he had a chance to land on the carrier, he can tell the rest of his unit when they're doing planning, let's say, hey, no, they really can't launch and recover aircraft all day, all night, because they need a break and they need to steam into the wind and all these other things he would have learned from doing it, not just reading about it. And again, with other countries, it helps us to understand them and them us. And so it is just something that we do to expose pilots to the different services and nations. Now, regarding your question of a Navy pilot flying a land-based fighter, an FA-18, by the way, can be and often is a land-based fighter. So there's really no transition required for that. But as far as taking an Air Force pilot and training him or her to land on a carrier, well, it's really no different than taking a Navy student prior to their first time. When there is sufficient experience, you go through the syllabus, and then the pilot lands on the carrier for the first time. And yes, there is some cost involved with doing that for an Air Force pilot, but again, the benefits of the exposure they get is well worth it. Thanks, Louis. Let's take now a phone call from Adam. Hi, Jello. This is Adam calling from Kalamazoo, Michigan. You had referred to your experiences at Top Gun several times, and I think on the Top Gun episode, you mentioned that 36 air crews on the Navy side make their way through the course over the course of a year. I was wondering how many Marine air crews make their way through the course. I was also wondering what kind of stereotypes exist between Navy, Marines, Air Force, uh, and I guess Army pilots, if there is any, uh, and what kind of you know sense of superiority or inferiority they have between the different services. Thanks again. Love the podcast. So great questions, Adam. To your first point, I had to ask Grand back from episode seven, and he tells me nowadays about three to four Marine Corps pilots and Wizzos graduate Top Gun every year. Now, regarding your second question, this is, of course, a bit of a slippery slope for me, because what I presume you want me to tell you is that the Marines are burly chest thumpers who will rip your face off. The Air Force pilots are diminutive, almost nerdy guys who will quietly kill you in your sleep. The Navy guys are the cool hand Luke, who will vanquish you in a gentleman's duel, and that the Army pilots are the socially awkward guys who distract you while their buddies kill you from the flank. But... The danger in stereotypes like that, which I would never do, is that, first, stereotypes, while sometimes true and occasionally mostly true, they're not always true. And so you have to be careful with that. And secondly, stereotypes change over time. Even during my time, 25 years in the Navy, I noticed military pilots in our branch alone changed from a bit more of the chest thumpers to the more thoughtful generation coming along today who's more calculated and less just devil-may-care type pilots. So, uh, dangerous question there, Adam, but I appreciate it. And no, I'm not going to offer you any stereotypes. 
All right, on to a question. This is from Jim in Pennsylvania. He says, my question is based on my limited experience as a civilian flyer. One of the things my CFI, which means Certified Flight Instructor, hammered in throughout training was self-assessment prior to the flight. Am I in good physical and mental state to fly? I'm wondering if this doctrine is held in the same regard in a military setting as in the civilian setting. If a sortie is planned, but a pilot is getting over a cold or some other minor illness, is that taken into account for pilot readiness? Yes, Jim, absolutely. Now, we in the military have two levels of this. Number one, we police ourselves. We are expected to come clean and tell the squadron that we cannot fly today if we either don't feel well or have some sort of issue, whether it was lack of sleep or interrupted sleep or some sort of interpersonal thing going on. Maybe the marriage is on the rocks. There's a sick kid at home. Any of those things, we're expected to reach out to the operations officer or the commanding officer and say, hey, I I just can't not fly today. And normally that person will be taken off the flight schedule. They will not be required to fly. Now, where it's a little different than I presume in your civilian experiences is that a squadron, especially deployed, but even so back home, is a lot like a team. And a team looks out for each other. So if I were the operations officer and pilot Jim showed up one morning and he just was wiping his nose a lot and was coughing and wheezing, I'm probably going to ask him, how's his health? If he looks like he's not all there, he's on the phone and he looks distressed, I might even pull him aside and ask, how's it going at home? What else is going on? And if there is a risk in flying that pilot, well, then we're going to take him off the flight schedule because usually, not always, but usually there's no need to risk putting someone up there whose mental or physical health is not all there. Now, I say usually and mostly because sometimes in combat, there might be a need depending on how much attrition we've had and who else is not able to fly. But for the most part, we police ourselves and we police each other. Good question, Jim. All right, let's take another phone call now. Hey, gentlemen, this is Andy from Buffalo, New York. I'm curious about the Hornets 20 millimeter gun. You know, in Top Gun, we always hear Maverick say, you know, I'm too close for missiles. I'm switching the guns. Is that really when the gun is going to be used? And with today's advanced missile and radar systems, are you even getting that close anymore to enemy aircraft? Thanks. Love the show. All right, Andy, great question. And yeah, I'm allowed to quote the movie, as are you. But again, if Grand were here, he'd probably try to charge me 20 bucks. But too close for missiles, switching the guns. Let's look at it this way. The missiles have a much longer range and the gun has a range within normally about a mile. So anytime you are too close for a missile and you see what's called a break X or it's within the minimum range of the weapon, well, then the gun effectively has no minimum range other than your ability to avoid the damage of the aircraft that you inflict on your target. And so you can use that all the way down to virtually zero feet. So you can almost always use the gun, even though a missile may get to a point where it's not usable. And so the gun can be used in those close range fights. It can also be used in a passing fleeting shot. It's kind of like if you're outside on a nice summer day and your kids are running around the yard and you've got the garden hose and you put your thumb over the nozzle and you kind of spray it as they run by, you might get them briefly wet. We can do the same thing called a snapshot with a gun and get a few hits on the target in various quickly passing scenarios of aircraft merging and passing each other. Now, your second part of that question is a little dangerous for those of us who used to instruct at Top Gun, because the reason Top Gun came to be is that sometime, I suppose, in the mid to late 60s, they decided that with beyond visual range missiles, we wouldn't need a gun anymore because we'll just shoot them out at range. And as we all learned from Vietnam, we lost the ability to dogfight. And in fact, the F-4 did not have a gun on the early models. And so we don't assume anymore that the technology or the fog of war will always allow us to kill our opponents out at range. We assume that there will be a knife fight and the knife fight can take place in close proximity, like in a phone booth, we like to call it. And when it comes time to that, all you may have is your ability to stab, bite, pull, tear, whatever, and a gun is fantastic for those purposes. Now, the fact that the F-35, certain versions of it don't have the gun, we've covered that here before on the show, and we won't get back into that. But yes, I think there is always going to be a need for a gun on combat military aircraft. 
All right, the last question for today then will come from Isaac in Seattle. He says, when do you think you most felt that you were about to die in the cockpit or after ejecting, aside from your first night carrier landing? Well, so Isaac, my first night carrier landing, while scary, doesn't stick out in my mind as the most scariest night landing I ever had. That would probably be the night on the Nimitz off the coast of Perth, Australia in 2005, as chronicled in the PBS special Carrier. And that was pretty harrowing. But it was just scary. I never, I didn't think I was going to die. I just wanted to get aboard and finally did, thankfully. Now, I never ejected, so I can't speak to that. Um, otherwise, to answer your question, I never really felt like I was about to die. Now, there were certain moments where all of a sudden someone turns in front of you or you're flying in formation and you look away. When you look back, your lead is turning the other way that you didn't expect and you have a sudden flurry of activity and your shot of adrenaline gets your heart rate up and you have to pull or push to get out of the way. And that's kind of scary. But me personally, I never had such a quick brush with death other than just fleeting moments and Maybe I can get someone on the show, and in fact, I'm sure I will, and probably have before, guys like Willie D, who had to eject after shooting down three aircraft one afternoon in Vietnam. So I'm probably the wrong person to ask this to, but I do appreciate the question. All right, so let's move on to the interview. You'll hear that we're outside. There will be some audio challenges. And before we roll the interview, I want to point out that after mentioning Brad Elward's seminal book on the development of the FA-18 Super Hornet on the last episode, several listeners followed the link provided on our shop page and purchased the book. Thank you very much. Well, Brad was so grateful for that, that when he found out what we were covering for this week's aircraft, he shipped me a copy of another one of his books titled S3 Viking in Action. At 80 pages and full of glossy color photographs of the S3 inside and out, the book is a great complement to this interview and a wonderful addition to your aviation library. And the best part is, it only costs around 10 bucks on Amazon. So if you want to learn more about the mighty Warhoof, and you'll soon find out what that means, pick up Brad Elward's S3 Viking in Action, available on Amazon via the link on our website and in the show notes of this episode. In doing so, you help support your favorite podcast. Thanks. Okay, on to the interview. All right, today on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, we are in, at least my phone says, Sunshine, Chula Vista. Is that where you live? Yes, sir. Well, let's call it East Lake. East Lake. And it says it's 67 degrees and mostly sunny. And I'm in shorts and a t-shirt. Well, that's not that important, but what day is it? It's oh, like the January middle of... 20, the end of January, <laughs> the end of January. And here we are. And joining us is my very good friend and a former instructor of yours. Indeed. David Slayton, United States Navy commander, retired call sign Deke. Deke, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Awesome. Well, as you know, today we are talking about the S3 Viking, one of many aircraft that you flew. And to tell the listener more about that, give us a background on you. Where you're from, what did you do in the military, and what are you doing now? Sure. Well, I grew up on the beaches of South Florida and Southern California. I joined the Navy at the ripe age of 17 and initially went into P3s and then eventually ended up in S3s and uh, finished out my flying career in Prowlers. Got about 5,000 flight hours total, about 1,800 in the, uh, in the S3, uh, a great aircraft to be, uh, to be sure. So as you well know, finished out my undergraduate degree at UCLA, ended up going to business school here in San Diego at the University of San Diego. I was fortunate to go to the Naval War College and then ended my academic career and where I'm at right now at Stanford University. You are an overachiever. <laughs> Indeed. I'm a lucky man. Yeah. High IQ. Yeah. And what I failed to mention as part of the intro there with the weather and the middle of winter is that we are sitting outside at Sunshine's home, so you might hear the occasional dog barking next door or <laughs> aircraft flying over mm -hmm. on its way to Lindbergh Field. And uh, so, but it, it actually had better acoustics, I thought, than inside. So we're outside enjoying this horrible San Diego winter weather. <laughs> So, well, thanks for that, Deke. And yes, you, we could have brought you back for any number of subjects on this show. But since you flew the S3 and uh, Sunshine did as well, that is the discussion topic for today in our aircraft series. So, Sunshine, what's our first question? Yeah, so Deke, tell us why the S3 Viking was designed. Well, the S3 was, uh, came out of the S2 
F, the STUF, as an anti-submarine warfare aircraft, carrier-based, to counter the then Soviet uh, submarine and, and surface threat. You know, back in the mid-60s, early 70s, the Soviets decided they wanted to have a very expeditionary blue water navy. And to counter that, the S-2 was brought up and, and incorporated, and then to further advance the technology, because the Soviet threat was advancing both on the surface and particularly subsurface, the S-3 was produced, and I believe IOC'd or, or brought into the fleet in the early 70s. So right as the increase of the enormous Soviet and very capable Soviet surface fleet and a very capable subsurface uh, submarine fleet was brought to bear. Yeah, I think IOC'd in 1974, which is the same year I IOC. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, yeah, if you were. And retired, I think, in 2009. It, it was, yes. And then yeah. they, they kept flying it out of Point Magoo for range clearance, I want to say, until about 2016. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are one-offs every now and then, but yeah, definitely a big picture decommissioned in 2009. So this thing was built probably for some kind of max endurance, would you say, max range? Absolutely. Loitering uh, time, right? Yeah, just like Absolutely. a lot of a lot of aircraft on the uh, on the flight deck at that point, you know, range was important, endurance was important, uh, ordnance carrying capacity was important, and the S three had all of that. You know, as you know, it's very stable aircraft. It's a truck. It could carry a lot of ordnance, and it could carry a lot of sensors and a lot of a lot of sonar buoys, which for ASW was was very important. And the other aspect of it too is it could integrate very well with the other platforms. Uh, that did that did ASW at the time, mainly the P3 and mm -hmm. our own surface assets. Uh, so it could be linked uh, to other aircraft. It could be linked to other surface assets when prosecuting and, uh, and finding submarines and other surface units. Awesome. And I think in 1984 or 1987, excuse me, they actually switched the A's, about 113 of them, over to the B model. And with the B model, you got increased uh, capabilities via avionics. So the evolution of the mission, or I should say the mission evolved from anti-sub and anti-surface to also some uh, land land attack, right, support, and also some refueling. Absolutely. Well, yeah, and that yeah. was our next question is it was designed mainly for ASW, as you stated, but right. what it does well, I would argue, is ASW, ASUW, right, surface warfare that you talked about. Right. Um, tanking, I'm sorry to say, but it does pretty well. We'll get to that. That's an important mission. Though. And then ELINT, to a degree, we'll talk about that in the variants. Um, and then, like you were saying, surface attack. So we'll talk about the ordnance in just a bit. Okay, so we talked about what it does well. So why does it look the way it does? Well, interestingly enough, the initial design specification was for a carrier that by the time it came to the fleet no longer existed. So hmm. uh, in order to be an aircraft that at the time uh, was thought uh, to ride up an, a specific elevator on a carrier, it could not be longer than it was. And in order to counter the absence of a longer moment arm in length, uh, the aircraft has a very noticeable large vertical stabilizer or tail, uh, which does add to, you know, the aircraft is very stable, very, as you know, as a pilot, uh, and likewise myself as a, as a, as a co-pilot, very stable platform, long endurance, uh, you know, it's got a high wing, so the noticeable features of the aircraft are its large tail, and it's a high wing, high bypass turbo fan. Uh, engines, which gives it exceptional endurance, uh, exceptional speed uh, for the for the for the mission and and for the aircraft itself, and really uh, couldn't ask for for a better platform to do the mission set that it was designed to do. And the tail folds, right? Yeah, the tail folds, and as does because luxury, excuse me, real estate is a luxury on the carrier, and as the wings fold too. So. Absolutely. So it does t it does fold up into a very nice tight package, uh, which is appreciated both on land. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and on the ship. Well, on the wings fold because we need the horizontal space, but why does the tail fold? Just to get it in the hangar? Just to get it in the hangar. Okay. Right. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. And I think you'll see that uh, with other airplanes that we talk about and also the Hornet, they're going to, that control surface area that they needed that could be materialized by, or realized, I guess, by a tall vertical stab. Well, instead, let's just put two of them on, right? So you got some of the fighter series aircraft, the F series mm. aircraft, where they're going to just have two tails instead of one big one. Mm -hmm. Okay. For one of, that's just one of the reasons. So how about the variants? So we got the S3A, we talked about the S3B. 
What other variants are you aware of? So there was a COD version uh, for a while that uh, that they flew basically to get uh, people and, and equipment and, and mail and parts uh, on and off the carrier. That was that was around for a while and then was was can you remind the visitor? Uh, sorry, can you remind the listeners of what COD stands for? Please? Yeah, carrier onboard delivery. Right, and system. that one was the US three. I want to say that's correct. Okay. So that was that, around uh, like that, for utility. I think exactly. Yeah. So right. that was around for a little while. Did that uh, have a nickname? <clears throat> Miss Piggy, does that sound right? Oh, not, <laughs> not that I'm familiar with. Oh, okay, I don't know. Okay, it's not, it's, I think that. <laughs> very I small think, I think by the sunshine. Yeah. I think by the time you and I came into the community, yeah. uh, the US three was phased out, and the uh, the C two was the primary uh, utility aircraft uh, at the time. It was a unicorn. I remember a Rat Gasparino. Yes, he was there at the, the FRS or RAG with us, and right. he was the lone US three former pilot. Hmm. Right, yeah. right, All and right. Uh, and you know, interestingly enough, I think a majority of those airframes were were run out of uh, Westpac and out of the Philippines. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I trust there's some good stories that come, <laughs> come out of there. Air America so is, as well. Stories. And then another <laughs> version that came on later, around right about the time that I was going through flight school in the early '90s was the ES-3, so a SIGINT-based uh, version of the aircraft, very noticeably different exterior-wise, uh, a lot of extra antennas, as you, as you can imagine. Uh, it was a heavier version than the one that you and I flew, the S-3B, and very capable of aircraft, and again, was meant to provide tactical signal intelligence to the carrier, and was also designed uh, with the equipment to, to plug in, plug and play with, uh, with the other type uh, aircraft, surface units, uh, land-based units uh, at the time. So it was basically an, a, uh, a carrier-based version of the EP-3, some similar equipment, you know, everything you could pack inside the truck that the S-3 was. Uh, it was also a very, very capable, uh, very capable aircraft. And the guys who flew that weren't just the regular S-3 dudes pulled aside. They were like their own little spook Cadre of folk. guys that the, hid behind the they were. doors with no windows that's and right you barely ever talk to them <laughs> that's right they were a v Social they were vq they were not vs they were so they and were that's a, the squadron designation exactly mm -hmm. so they were designated as vq uh they flew with not uh, aws and uh, you know operators that hunted submarines in the back they flew with the with the cts and the, and the folks that do signal intelligence right they were also air crew trained, highly specialized sure. uh, operators to be and in the back CT of that is an enlisted <clears throat> rank or rate, I guess, for mm -hmm. uh, cryptology. Cryptology, basically. that's right. So, all right, yeah. well, we should probably leave it at that. Yeah, and then uh, the only thing I could think of would be the KS-3, which pretty much dropped the K and we still did the refueling. That's correct. Right. Yeah. Okay. That sounds right. Okay, we just talked about the different types or variants. So let's focus on the S-3B. What kind of armament does the S-3B have on board? Could carry quite a bit, and particularly towards the end of the, uh, the run on the B, so what came with the B initially was the, was the Harpoon missile, uh, which gave a very long reach for uh, anti-surface uh, unit warfare, again, to, to counter that Soviet uh, surface threat. Torpedoes with the Mark 48 uh, could carry four torpedoes, uh, carried a variety of different mines. We won't get into what type of mines, but needless to say, it could do mine warfare. Mm -hmm. Initially, was uh, outfitted to carry the dumb bomb, you know, series. Mark 80s. Exactly, mm -hmm. Mark 80 series. Uh, and then, again, towards the latter part of the, the service life of the aircraft, was able to carry uh, the Maverick uh, missile and was able to carry the SLAM and the SLAM ER. Again, another long range uh, anti surface, both for land and, uh, and ship. Uh, for, for the aircraft. So again, very, at towards the end, just like most naval aircraft uh, of their career, became a very capable attack platform. Yeah, I agree. And with the Maverick, they had the IR version, right? The Echo, AGM-65 Echo, and also the laser designated uh, 65 Foxtrot model. That's what correct. If you have those backwards, don't you? Isn't the E the laser and the F is the IR? Oh, yeah. I thought the IR came first and the laser was better. And I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll add it in the post script here. We always cover or just <laughs> come back <laughs> anyway. Totally. Anyway. The only thing is cluster bombs, right? That's yeah. right. Yeah. So uh, call me crazy, but I think I remember a time that you and I were in a plane and we went to the Chocolate Mountain Range. So we blasted off out of North Island, if you can call an S3 blasting off. <laughs> right. Anyway, we headed out and we dropped a cluster bomb, a CBU-100, out there in the Chocolate Mountain Range. Yeah, it Which was, was a lot of fun. It was great. Uh, you know, the, the, the proximity of, of the Chocolate Mountains and the, and the ranges to, to San Diego 
uh, was was incredible. You know, provided great opportunities to go out there and train and to train towards that mission set. And again, that munition was is a uh, a great uh, piece of ordnance to have against against the surface unit because again, it has a very large footprint when it hits the surface, and uh, it can it can do what needs to be done uh, when you're trying to take out surface units. Yeah, we had a <clears throat> show last year about air to surface munitions and. Farva, our guest, talked about some of the fallout, though, with cluster munitions. The only other thing I had for armament, and I don't think it's armament at all, is sonar buoys, right? That's more of a sensor? Right. Yeah. That's well, considered, or, yes. That's, is it? Yeah, that's considered, uh, there's armament and there's ordnance, and, oh. and the buoys fall under the, the ordnance part of it. Oh, and again, that's part of our there. extended sensor package for the acoustic side sure. of the house. And the, the also the, the great thing about sonar buoys was they can not only be used by the aircraft that drops them, but any other aircraft in the area or, or surface ships. So again, it, it adds to the ability to have that networked approach to prosecuting uh, submarines using a common sensor. Right. Well, and on that note, since I don't know if there's any other good place to talk about it, what's the big boom or something that comes out the tail of the airplane on the S3? Ah. Yes, the Go magnetic anomaly detector. Okay. The, AS, the ASQ-81, right. uh, and then there was another advanced version of that, but that was basically if you flew over something that was big and metallic, you would get an indication, such as a submarine, mm -hmm. uh, that there was something there. And it was used as a, as a corroborating or a validating sensor. Mm. Uh, so if you had some indication that there was a submarine uh, in the area, you could, you could fly in the vicinity or over that suspected uh, area of, of, uh, of susceptibility, so to speak, or, or what you could, what you, where you thought a submarine would be. And that mm. would be a validating sensor to say, yes, there's definitely something there, large and magnetic, uh, under the water. And if it was moving, that was a pretty good indication <laughs> yeah. that it was going to be a submarine. Yeah. And I think you bring up a good point that it was a validating <clears throat> sensor, because to me, well, nowadays with the F-35, we think of sensor fusion, big buzz term, right? Well, I think even back then, the S-3 had a very rudimentary, I guess, approach to sensor fusion, right? We had our apps, 116 became the 137, I think, right? right. The in inverse synthetic aperture radar. Whoa. And the, the uh, FLIR, the forward-looking infrared, and then the MAD. Mm -hmm. Put those things together with the, uh, the 67s, is that right? ALR 67, I think it was? the uh, 76. That's, that's a 76. Ah. Yeah, yeah, the ESM. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But okay. you could, these suites, you could all tie together and basically provide a pretty nice surface picture, wouldn't that, you say? That's exactly right. And again, you have any number, six or seven different things that you could identify, positively identify a target with. If it's on the surface, you've got radar, you have ELINT, you know, the ESM suite, uh, you have the radar and you have visual. Under the water, where things get a little bit more complicated, you have to identify the targets acoustically, and that's what the sonar buoys were for. Uh, and then you could back that up uh, with the magnetic anomaly detector, the MAD system. So again, just because you couldn't see it, doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah. So the yeah. MAD was passive? It, well, yes. Was, yeah, yeah, exactly passive. right. Did yeah. you guys string any cable or any like long antenna or anything like that? Uh, no, no. Like an E6 different, or yeah, different, no, not different at all. mission. No, but have you ever seen a MAD get dropped out of an S3? No, no, I've have never. Have you ever heard about? <laughs> I've, uh -oh. I can imagine that that possibly could have happened so, maybe once or twice. Once or twice, and there was a call sign, perhaps, out of Nomad. Do you remember that guy from the uh, VS-41? So he's on the cat shot, and apparently it's got some security. So it, it's stowed, right, on the carrier, because real estate is a luxury. Mm -hmm. It's stowed, and apparently the locking bolts or mechanism was not properly rigged, and that would not be an air crew issue. That would be more of a maintainer issue. And they take the cat shot, and basically the inertia, you know, it stays put. So the, the airplane goes off the front, and the mad slips out the back and drops on the ground. Yeah. That doesn't sound like a good day for a few people. No, I agree. Not, I agree. Not yeah. good at all. Not, not a cheap all piece right. of gear. So, yeah. When, okay, so then uh, we talked about the sensor suite. So let's go into the strengths and weaknesses. We'll start with the strengths of the S3. Sure. Without question, you know, that the stability, uh, you know, and as, 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 as aviators, we can appreciate the stability of that airframe was incredible. Uh, very forgiving. Uh, airframe, uh, particularly you know, compared to say the Prowler or some other aircraft out there. So very stable platform. Uh, the endurance, uh, the efficiency of, of the aircraft were, were incredible. And the carrying capacity of the airplane were, were enormous. Uh, could carry a lot of, a lot of armament, a lot of ordnance, a crew of four, and just a very stable, you know, long endurance uh, aircraft, unmatched uh, today without question. 
Absolutely. I talked about the high bypass ratio TF-34s, right, which are also the ones used on the A-10. That's right. The A-10, I think they, they run them a little hotter, though. Mm. They do. But other than that, so for more performance. But then we talked about max endurance, max range, or loiter, you mentioned. So the high wings and the big wings. Mm-hmm. So if something has got high wings and it's above the center of gravity, I tend to think of Dutch roll, right, which is that roll y'all coupling moment. Right. So I think you and I notice Dutch roll a lot pretty much in landing configuration. Right, and always seem to be in close. Uh, <laughs> Amen. In, uh, in Inside three quarters of a mile. Yes, sir. when trying to land on the carrier. To yes. be clear. Yeah. Yes. Okay. When landing on the carrier, and that's you know, and again, that's that's a result of the uh, of the design of the aircraft. You know, it's shorter, has that big tail on it, uh, so Dutch roll could be could be induced. And you know, there was there were parts of the of the automatic flight control system AFCS uh, that were incorporated uh, into the aircraft to help counter that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when one of those axes uh, were not available of the AFCS, the automatic flight control system, it made it made the pilot's day a little bit uh, a little bit harder yeah. uh, coming aboard the boat. That's yeah. for sure. Absolutely. Remember the if the yaw damper didn't work, right? That's right. Yeah, we we're kind of doing the Stevie Wonders. We're coming down the land. So <laughs> yes, no, nothing and against that fine right musician, now. but yeah. yeah. So all right, <laughs> very true. Um, some other strengths in the landing, so very stable landing configuration, you don't mind. And uh, can you tell us a little about direct lift control, DLC? Absolutely. Because the aircraft was so efficient and so stable, it loved to fly, which means it was tough to actually uh, nail that OK3 wire in the S3. So an, an additional aid for the pilots and the air crew in the aircraft was directional lift control, which basically aided in killing the lift at exactly the right moment. Uh, when approaching, uh, when in the landing area, so to speak, and to be able to settle the airplane nicely down uh, into, into the wires. And, and, and it was an uh, incredible aid uh, for the pilots to have. Uh, Crutch or aid? <laughs> uh, we'll yes, call it yes, aid. I'll leave it as aid, yeah. an aid coming into the ship. And, and if memory serves, the DLC, so it's a button on the stick yes. that's, that's going to actuate the spoilers when it pops up. When they pop up, there's actually a light on the nose wheel that would tell the landing signals officer, right, the LSO, is that, hey, paddles, look, sunshine's cheating, right? <laughs> now, a good maintainer, though, you probably remember, would snip that light or somehow this, uh, it would not work anymore. Yeah, on occasion, I think there was, uh, those lights would go out. Yeah, and, it's funny uh, how that works. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's interesting that they put it on in the first place, but I guess someone in the design decided it was needed. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So it was a good time. Um, so what about the, the big bulbous nose? I mean, kind of the, when I was at the RAG, they used to think it looked like Shamu. So... Not a terribly sexy airframe, but it did a good job of descending, I would say. so. Exactly. And the, you know, the fact of the matter is, is the reason why the radome in the, the front of the aircraft is so large is to house the, the radar, uh, which was a, a primary sensor to have in there. Again, starting it off with the APS-116 in the A and then going to the very capable APS-137, the ISAR, in the B model. And uh, if you, when you lifted up that radome and you saw what was called the football behind the radome, which uh, housed the antenna in the uh, IFF and a number of other sensors that were, that were on that pedestal. But again, uh, incredible, unmatched, uh, quite honestly, at the time uh, for radar, particularly for doing uh, surface and anti-surface warfare. And I would say that blunt object of a nose also served aerodynamically very a great purpose of slowing the plane down as it descended. So we get some pretty crazy descent rates. If we start up at like 25,000 feet and we'd see, uh, you know, we would joke that you could see, or maybe you really could see a periscope, right? Right. With the APS-137 at quite a distance. So we would kind of want to fold our wings, not really, right? And come back tuck down. Tuck your wings, maybe. Tuck almost, your wings, yeah, there like you a bird, go. Kind of huh? like a bird, yeah, and head down to the surface. So we'd get like a 25, 30 degree nose low to deploy the speed brakes and sometimes get up to 45 degrees nose low heading toward the water. Exactly. Mm. And uh, again, I haven't, haven't been in the airframe uh, in both a test uh, scenario out of Pax River as well as operationally. Uh, it's very noticeable when you hit the, uh, the envelope of, uh, of the airframe uh, speed-wise. Uh, it's not meant to go supersonic. <laughs> it's got windshield and, wipers. Yes, it does. It's got windshield <laughs> wipers. And there are a lot of uh, both visual and acoustic uh, feedback mechanisms that the airplane would give you when you were starting to hit the, the max airframe uh, limit of, uh, uh, of, of, the, of the jet. And uh, it was not hard to get, particularly if you're coming out of altitude uh, to get down on the surface in a hurry. You know, Sunshine, this 
reminds me of something maybe we should add to our list of questions on the aircraft series, because for me on the F-18, it was very clear. I didn't even think about performance, but maybe we should add in the future speed, altitude, Gs, et cetera. And I hate to put you on the spot, but for the S-3, what was like a peak G or max speed or max C? Three, three and a half. Three, three and, and a half, half Gs, because wow. uh, as a young buck, I overstressed it. Oh, and right. the uh, airframers yeah. and the maintenance master chief had my derriere, let's say. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How about speed or altitude? Uh, 450. 450, yeah. 450 okay. was 450 a max knots. speed. Yeah, 0.79 right. Mach. Okay. Uh, for, and what was the highest you guys ever took one? Uh, well, I oh, definitely hit the, oh, for altitude wise. Yeah, once yeah, you got above about 30,000 feet, it started getting a little, a little, uh, anemic. Fluffy. Okay. Yeah, so to speak. Totally with a high right. bypass. Yeah. Yeah. So it was meant Not to fly at lower altitudes, obviously. And, uh, so it performed well sure. in, in that environment. And, uh, but again, if you were, if you were transiting, uh, you try to get as high as possible to increase the efficiency of, of the uh, of the engines, mm -hmm. but you get up to about thirty thousand feet, but comfortably, you wouldn't normally want to get above about twenty five, just okay. to have enough air sure. for those wings to be flying through. Gotcha. Yeah, and yeah, th speaking of performance, so when I cruised on the Kennedy in the early two thousands with VS thirty one, the Tomcat squadron up on the you know they're kind of the, the big fighter guys. They had their time to climb records from off the cat, especially during the, the night launches to see how quickly they get up to thirty five thousand feet. We had a time to descend, so we because as Deke said earlier, that thing loved to fly, right? So yeah. we'd go idle up at twenty five thousand feet, and we time how long it took us to get down to a min airspeed and a min altitude. So anyway, lots of good performance out of that thing. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Moving on. Uh, how about weaknesses? What are some weaknesses of the S3B? Well, it wasn't the quickest airplane in the world, uh, <laughs> as, as, we, early, as, right. as we identified. Uh, you know, they're quite honestly, for what it was designed to do, not a whole lot of weaknesses do come to mind, quite honestly. It That's really, a testament it, to the airplane. Yeah, mm -hmm. it really performed well for in the mission set it was designed to do. And as I mentioned before, and I think Sunshine, as you mentioned before, a very, very stable Aircraft, uh, great to fly, fun to fly, and uh, as far as weaknesses go, I, I really can't think of, of too many. You know, beyond you know the the inherent Dutch roll, mm. uh, if you didn't have a yaw dampener. But I mean, those are compared to some other uh, aircraft. It really was a, a dream to fly. Yeah, I'd say for me, the only thing is, and it was not original design spec, we'll call it, but it was the the mission tanking. So as the the missions evolved, and you got the mission tanking. You had to launch the S3 early off the carrier so he could climb up the altitude and then try to accelerate to 250, while the Hornets sometimes would go zooming by me at 300 because <laughs> yeah. they didn't do a good radar intercept. So just like you said, acceleration, right? right. Well, and to be fair, right, that was a mission that was adapted to the airframe later. Oh, totally, not that yeah. it was designed not, not for. Not a design spec. So no. I was going to say the same thing I've got in my notes here, was when we would plan back when it was our only tanker that we needed, let's say, fuel out in front of us for a strike, to your point, you had to launch it super early because it took forever to get out there. But it was a very good tanker, just a little bit slow to get where we needed. But that's not the fault of the aircraft. That was the oh, fault no, of no. us not we having had, a better system. I was going to say a desperate Navy. Yeah, yeah that's all you it bet. was. Yeah. All right. and I think I think we would climb at 220 indicated, and those Hornets would be going. We usually, what, 300, 350? Oh, yeah. so 300, generally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was fun, though. Good yep. to watch the overruns. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, then uh, notoriety. So where would our audience have seen an S3? Good question. Well, right now you can see one on the flight deck of the uh, USS Midway in, <laughs> San, in, in San Diego. Yeah. Yep. There's not too many in Hollywood, I don't think, as no. far as movies yeah. go. No, there's not. And uh, I'm trying to remember where else they they could be. You know, again, it's part of it's part of the, the legacy air wing, so to speak, now. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, they're retired. They're they're in pro displayed prominently uh, throughout yeah. uh, different places in, in the United States. But it's really, a, it's got a, a low, I would say, public recognition mm -hmm. uh, uh, to it. It's uh, it's not the sexiest airplane in the world, but boy, was it capable. So it won't make the calendars, but uh, <laughs> but it was Navy One, right? It brought President Bush aboard. Exactly. So, Abraham so, Lincoln, May of 2003, the only sitting president to land on a carrier. That's right. So yeah. uh, That was kind of cool. Yeah, absolutely. And it was, uh, it, and that was, I think, a lot of people you know, looked at it it's like, what kind of aircraft is that? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the, the, the president just, just, just crawled out of it. That's right. Yeah. And uh, but no, that was definitely a, a, a bit of limelight for the uh, for the airframe. Sure. And on that note, I don't know if this is a good place to bring it up, but it has a nickname Hoover. And if you've ever been on the Coronado Beach back when it used to land here, it has kind of a whoop sound. I'm not a very good it's voice well done, actor, well but done. thank you. What was that all about there, 
sunshine. I mean, you were the, the guy manipulating well, the throttles. I was the guy making that sound. Deke was probably yelling at me, dude, you're behind the power curve. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so to me, the way I understood it is the engine nacelles hang off the wings, the okay. high, high wings. And what would happen is you'd basically, the engine would vibrate and hit kind of a natural frequency of the nacelle, mm -hmm. and it would resonate. Hmm. And that resonance was uh, in the sound of the whoop whoop, okay. which became known as the war hoover, or the hoover, right? Because the hoover okay. vacuum cleaner, we used to All call right. it the war hoover. Exactly. All right. And uh, and usually if you hear a whoop whoop in a landing pattern, I think the pilot's a little behind the power curve. In other words, he needs to add more power more quickly. He's at a low throttle setting. Okay. So, hmm. so when you're coming up on the throttles. Interesting. Yeah. All right, Deke, so we talked about the uh, specifics of the, the S3. Now, give us a C story. So the one C story that I'll bring forward on this highlights both the, the inherent safety of, of the aircraft to the inherent dangers of, uh, of carrier aviation, and three, how well-trained we are as aviators uh, within the Navy to handle very dynamic, complex, and ambiguous situations uh, at times. So as it would be, this scenario happened at night, of course. At the uh, ship. At the ship. Dark and stark that's like, yeah, well, that's like uh, <laughs> snowing uh, right both, uphill both ways to school. That's right. day, we went yeah, to school. So, yeah. Anyway. so uh, coming back in, last night recovery, coming into the ship, and as we're, as we're coming down the chute uh, inside of a mile, I noticed that we're getting some yaw excursions on the aircraft, so I checked the seat to make sure that the yaw damper is engaged, uh, and it was and kind of you know, doing a scan of, of all the engine instruments and the instruments inside the cockpit is good. You know, I double checked with, with, uh, with the pilots, like, hey, you know, you happen to you know, be resting your foot on the, on the rudder pedal, or you know, we're, we're getting some yaw excursions here, we're fighting line up a little bit. No, 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 we're going good. So, we, so we're in close, we're still, we're still fighting line up all the way, uh, all the way into the wires. Uh, trap successfully on board the ship, uh, fold up the wings and turn right out of the LA to go park. And as we come up on the power to get out of the out of the landing area, I start to see people running away from us. Now normally when you land you have you see people running towards the aircraft to, to start, you know, <laughs> to start tying you down or, or whatever needs to be happen. And then out of the corner of my eye, out of my peripheral vision, I see in the rear in the rear mirror on the left side of the aircraft, I see a, a, a flash and then I hear a bang, uh, oh. and then our entire aircraft is, is engulfed in flames. So our number one engine had failed catastrophically, and, uh, and basically so quickly I got the APU. We lost all power, got the APU up and, up and running. Uh, people were still running away from the aircraft. We were on fire. I, I told my pilot, stick, I said, stick with it. Don't. When fire is outside the airplane, that's good. <laughs> You stay it's when fire. Inside, that's yeah. right. When fire is outside the airplane, <laughs> you stay inside the airplane because, like most good naval aircraft, it's a very survivable container. Uh, to put it very bluntly, when fire is inside the airplane, then that's when you pull the handle and you get out of the airplane. So this scenario was: the fire was outside the airplane. We were inside the airplane, comfy. We had power, so we had brakes. We had everything we needed. That was the other great thing about the S3 is that auxiliary power unit, you know, provided all the power, all the hydraulics, all the, everything you needed uh, to survive. And at that moment in time, that's what it was about. It was about surviving. So got the airplane repowered, got it stopped. The little uh, fire truck that's on the flight deck, the P-19 came over and, uh, and foamed us down and put us out. And I got to tell you, it was incredible to see the, the footage of what actually happened because we literally we were we disappeared into a fireball right there on the uh, on the wow. flight deck and uh, they put us out rather quickly and then once all the they got us tied down and uh, we got out of the airplane uh, went over and looked at that number one engine and the only thing that was left uh, within the nacelle was the fan disc and that was it the rest of the motor had basically disintegrated and was now just this small pile of metal chips uh, sitting at the bottom of the nacelle. So, so it was determined, you know, it was catastrophic mechanical failure caused by a hydraulic leak, which then, you know, compounded uh, into the into total destruction. But again, it was, you know, if, it's, if anything's bad, it's going to happen at the ship. It's normally going to happen at night. Yeah. And, uh, but again, it's a testament not only to, to our training as aviators, but everyone on the flight deck did exactly what they needed to do. 
and for a situation that could have gone much worse, it didn't. That's awesome. <laughs> Sheesh. Sunshine, you flew the S3. Do you have a good sea story? I did. It's not as exciting as Deke's, but uh, <laughs> I had some couple, you know, landing emergencies, if you will. But for me, the, the biggest one was day. We called it double SC. Yeah. So surface surveillance coordination, right. I believe. Okay. Control. Yeah. It's basic control. Thank you. It's got some, we got some time out there to, once we do our tanking, to give the Hornets some gas, then we go out and just fly around. Well, we happen to have Mark 76s on that day. Mm -hmm. So I get okay. some practice bombs yeah. on. And I'm with Shaka Khan, uh -huh. Zef Khan, right? Yeah. Great American. And uh, we're out there flying around, and we decide we're going to drop some in a normal uh, dive delivery. But on one of them, we thought, let's let's pickle the weapon, and let's fly with it, actually. And we're going to roll up and watch it. So we're doing some some kind of a Formation free fall flying? kind of, I hate to say zero G, but you know what I'm saying, less than one G flight, if you will. Well, that day, Zef had used the piddle pack. Oh, piddle pack dear. is yeah here we go so piddle pack is going to be a giant ziploc bag with a desk in at the bottom I'm supposed to you know when you got to go you got to go you put it in the bag well he put it over to his he's in the right seat so he put it to the right of him so outboard so we stuffed the nose excuse me i stuffed the nose to follow the mark 76 i'm watching the mark 76 across the cockpit so out of the right side of the airplane and all of a sudden i see this ziploc bag come floating out with its contents right well unfortunately Shaka that day had failed to properly zip tie oh, shut boy. the bag. So this is the first time I've ever seen droplets be that kind of spiraly kind of thing. So basically some of the the, the waste, if you will, starts uh -huh. floating in the cockpit. And as I'm watching, I'm thinking, well, it's heading toward me. <laughs> so I need to change where the airplane's going because it's floating toward me. And also the water's getting bigger, if you right. will, right? We're coming downhill. So I'm basically, as I recover, I'm watching these yellow water droplets and they splatter on my lap oh. and on our uh, CDNU, our navigation unit between the two of us. And oh, by the way, we still have about an hour and a half left of a mission. So I'm sitting there for an hour and a half in Shaka's urine, basically. <laughs> so pretty exciting. That's awful. Did you make it him was. clean it up when you guys landed? It was on my crotch, dude. Oh, no. Uh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's even worse. Hey, were you guys underway? I mean, okay. We, uh, anyway, wow, that's a so. crazy one. So I didn't fly the S3, but I have a S3C oh, story. Okay. It's, it's not a very pleasant one, I'm afraid. We were uh -oh. in the Arabian Gulf in December of 1999, and we were launching to do an air show practice because we mm. were, as an air wing, going to fly over the Dubai air show. And the video is no longer on YouTube, which is probably good, but if you were to ever find the video, you would see an S3 launching off the waste catapult, I think catapult three, and as it follows it to the end of the shot, you see a, an F-18 turning onto Cat 1, and that was me. Oh. And all I remember from that day is there was a bunch of jets parked on the two row, right, on Cat 2. And I remember seeing the S3 take off. It's weird, I'm actually getting a little kind of tense thinking about it again. Um, I remember seeing it take off. I remember seeing it pitch up quickly, yaw and rotate to the left quickly, which normally we do a clearing turn off the catapult in the daytime to the left off the waist, to the right or starboard off the bow. And in that split second, I realized that's way too fast. What are you doing? And before I could think about it, it was upside down behind the jets that I was looking through to see mm. the thing. So it, oh. it departed control flight, rolling left and yawing by the time it got off the catapult within a split second. And I saw a flash and some smoke and realized that they had ejected. And then a big splash. And of course, at that point, if you ever see any other mishaps on YouTube carry deck, everybody runs over and tries to figure out what happened. And of course, at that point, the yellow shirt stopped me. Everyone was in shock. We just sat there and said, what just happened? The helicopter who came in said something on the radio to the effect of, I've got two survivors in the water. And at that point, I breathed a huge sigh of relief because I thought, what just happened? We lost an airplane, but thank God we have two quote-unquote survivors in the water. Well, I found out later that the air crew, only two, thankfully not the full four that the S3 carries, but I knew each of them. And in fact, they had ejected out of the envelope straight into the water and both perished. Mm. And that was really tragic, not only because we lost two good sailors and aviators, but because I watched it. And I oh, replay yeah. that sometimes in my mind, and it gives me still to this day a little bit of goosebumps and shivers. And I won't talk about what happened because part of that is part of the safety review, and a lot of that is not classified, but we treat that information as privileged, and we're not supposed to disclose it. But it was really unfortunate, and we lost an airplane and two aircrew, and it's, it, for me, 
brought as close to home as you can get just how serious this business is and that lives are at stake. Very unforgiving indeed, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they briefed that incident to us at, at the RAG, I remember just Did the, they? Yeah. Well, sorry to end on a downer, my goodness, but uh, well, yeah, that was... Not that, that quite was... the ending, right? We've got one more question for Deke. Yeah. And how in the world... Did you get your call sign? That's right. Well, I am fortunate <laughs> that it's more affiliated with my name than actions or, or, or lack thereof. So Deke Slayton, Donald K. Slayton, was one of the original uh, Mercury 7 astronauts That's back, right. back at the start of uh, of NASA. And, uh, you know, people ask me if I'm actually related uh, to Donald K. Slayton, and I, and I often respond with, we're about as close on the family tree as chipmunks and chimpanzees uh but we are uh we are indeed uh related so oh, that oh. that call sign came to me uh, early in my career and thank goodness it's stuck there was a <laughs> lot of good opportunities for a call sign change uh, throughout my career based on uh just pure buffoonery as most aviators have in their career but uh i'm fortunate that it's stuck and like you know, most good call signs it's single syllable it's easy to remember Combines well with uh, with expletives uh, when people are trying to get your attention. That's right. And, uh, and and to this day, I'll still I'll still answer to the call sign Deke. Do we have any idea why Donald Slayton got the call sign Deke? Uh, just a DK, you know Donald okay, yeah. Donald K. You know it's kind of you know kind oh, of pressed sure. pressed together. And uh, that was that. He was in the Air Force, but you know we can't fault him for that. Yeah, and no. uh, you know, ended up doing a seri- uh, mission at the end of the Apollo program with the Russians. So he finally got a chance to fly. He had a heart problem that kind of kept him out of the space program for a while, so he ran the astronaut office uh, for a good long time, and then finally got his uh, his day in space. Awesome. Yeah. Nice. Good story. Well, yeah. Great, great way to finish. Well, Deke, thank you for spending your time on this gloomy winter day in San uh-huh. Diego. <laughs> Tough life here. And I yeah. hope the uh, wind noise and everything else was bearable for folks. I'm sure they enjoyed it. I guess the only other thing we might sometimes ask our guests is, what's the future hold for you? I mean, I get to see you a lot. We hang out here in San Diego, and I kind of know what you're doing, but what's important for the listener to know about Deke Slayton and what he's doing in the future? Well, I'm glad to say that uh, I still maintain my professional platform up at Stanford University, uh, well engaged with other nonprofit uh, think tanks, both in in Washington, D.C., and uh, the consultancy that, that I have uh, right now that is focused on national security as well as energy uh, items. And as you well know, I try to spend as much time on the water uh, sailing and in the water surfing and anything to do with, uh, with water. It's the whole reason why I joined the Navy to begin with was <laughs> to be on the water. Man and uh, continue to do it to this day. But. Well, I have been the benefactor of that, having come out on your sailboat a few times. I needed to learn how to surf, I guess, so we can go do that together. <laughs> but we didn't really touch on it. Um, you did touch talk about UCLA. That is where we met. So I don't remember who else I've had on this show that I've known as long as I've known you. That was the summer of 1990. Yes, we met in Newport, Newport, Rhode Island. And, and then uh, went to UCLA together. Then went to UCLA. And, so that's coming up on 30 years. Yes, and uh, a very fortunate and blessed 30 years it's been. Well, you have been a tremendous friend and a great shipmate. I appreciate you coming on the show today. I appreciate your service. How many total years? 28 years. 28 nice. years. Well, on behalf of the listener, thank you for your service to this nation. All right. Well, Sunshine, unless you got anything else, Dave, anything parting shots? Nope. That's good. Let's get out of here. All right. Well, that was a great discussion on the S3 Viking. I wish Sunshine was here to help wrap it up, but maybe we can get any follow-on thoughts with him another time. Once again, I want to thank my very dear friend, retired U.S. Navy Commander David Deke Slayton. Again, he and I have known each other for almost 30 years. We have been based in the same locations. We've cruise together. Just a wonderful guy, and I really have enjoyed his friendship. So Dave, thanks again, and let's get out on your sailboat again here soon. All right, some follow-up. So Sunshine and I got in a little bit of a 1v1 there, but yes, the AGM-65 Echo is the Laser Maverick, and the 65 Foxtrot is the IR Maverick, but no harm, no foul there. Now, one thing, too, in listening to ourselves later, we kept saying is in present tense of grammar on the S3, and maybe we should have said was in past tense, because again, the S3 is gone, but we all still think of it fondly, so I hope you'll forgive us for that, but I don't know, maybe there's still, I guess what, the NASA aircraft is probably flying, but otherwise, yes, it should be in the past tense, unfortunately. Now, we did 
expose you to many new terms and acronyms. And as always, you can find those on our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. Look for the glossary section, and you can glean not only those terms, but about 250 others now, having done this for quite a few episodes. And all that is available to you as a reference. All right. Well, I think that will about do it for this episode. Trying to think what else is on my mind here that might interest you. We have, as you know, many new initiatives going on and I have in the pipe many new episodes for you being recorded. The next couple might be on the A7 Corsair 2 and the H60 in all its variants. So look for that in future episodes of the aircraft series of this show. And we might interrupt the aircraft series once in a while and bring you some other stuff. I'm still working on the Blue Angels. I'm working as well with Sunshine to get some more technical stuff because everybody loved the fourth versus fifth gen episode so much. And we're working on some other initiatives as well. So stay tuned for all that and keep it right here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I want to remind you that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. So I want to thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. See ya! Thank you for listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877 mach 101 That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on all the usual social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content and to help support the show, visit our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and share us with your network. And if you have a moment to leave us a rating or review on iTunes, we would greatly appreciate it.